Hi, and welcome to the final episode of our Invertebrate Biology series. Once again, my name is Jeffrey Petraka, and I'm the curator of entomology out here at the Long Island Aquarium's Butterfly and Insect Zoo. Now, over the course of this series, we've seen so many crazy adaptations that invertebrates demonstrate in terms of both behavior and morphological adaptation, so body features. And all of these adaptations in one way or another ultimately help to increase the survivability of uh, these organisms, these invertebrates, in their particular habitats. And, but why though? What does it matter to survive, you know? And, Really what it comes down to is reproduction, passing on of an organism's genome to future generations, producing offspring. And so today's episode of Invertebrate Biology will focus on the many different adaptive strategies that different invertebrates use in order to reproduce and engage in courtship. And so, for instance, I have this moth here. This is a Chinese moon moth from Southeast Asia. It looks very much like our Luna moth from around here in the uh, United States. And she's been basically sitting still for the last three nights or so. We're going to figure out exactly why she's doing that. Let's take a look. We'll start by looking at butterflies and moths, since they're, they have some of the most amazing courtship displays out there. Butterfly courtship can be surprisingly complicated, involving ritualistic dances or flights, um, signaling between males and females, using wing patterns, um, or even territoriality, so uh, complex aggressive behavior towards one another. And believe it or not, these little delicate creatures can do some serious damage towards one another. Um, in particular, males fighting over females, um, or even males against females, surprisingly. And so this little Heliconius butterfly here has a very interesting courtship uh, ritual. Females will lay out on a branch with their wings open, uh, s uh, signaling to males to come by and uh, try to mate with them. And the male has to perform a delicate courtship flight, uh, which will entice the female into uh, letting him mate with her. And so here we see a male long wing of a different species actually attempting to mate with this very same female. And you can see his courtship flight basically consists of him fluttering over the top of her here. And she's going to decide whether or not he is of high enough quality uh, to be able to mate with her and sire offspring with her. Now, courtship displays like these among animals are thought to be indicative of a male's fitness. And in biology, a ter the term fitness refers to the ability of an organism to survive to reproductive age and bear offspring. So the stronger, the longer lived, and the more offspring that a uh, individual is capable of, the higher their fitness. And so these rituals are a way of females selecting for the most suitable and most high quality males. Now, I'm pretty sure this event will not be successful, but uh, essentially she will uh, stick up her abdomen in a, um, as a, uh, a way of saying no, back off, and she'll, she'll sort of drop her abdomen down as a way of inviting him in. And when butterflies do copulate, they will mate tail to tail. So they basically back up into each other and they'll stay together for a little bit. And the male usually can fly around, actually the female or the male can fly around with the, uh, with the other attached. Um, he actually has a little grappling hook on his reproductive organ that will get embedded inside of her reproductive tubes. Um, so they're pretty much like united <laughs> very strongly. Yeah, that's more like it. Here we see a couple of postmen attempting to copulate with each other. You can see she seems to not be having it. She keeps sticking her abdomen up in the air. But he'll try and try. And this is a female great egg fly. We saw these guys in a previous episode. Um, they're well known among butterflies for being one of the few that demonstrate some level of parental care. So the female, which this is here, will go ahead and lay eggs on her host plant and she'll kind of sit with them, almost like a chicken sitting on top of her eggs, uh, keeping them clear of parasites and other potential threats. But the reproductive behavior of these guys is uh, a little bit more aggressive. Um, it's not, you know, not as tender as this parental care. So male egg flies will claim a territory and fight off any other potential competing butterflies, uh, including other males of the same species or even other male butterflies or any other butterfly that might pose a threat to him uh, claiming any females that fly into his territory. And so here's a male egg fly. And as you can see, he's a little bit different looking than the female. He's actually got big white spots on the surface of his wings, 
you can hardly tell. But uh, so this guy, what he'll do is essentially claim a territory and he'll attack any butterflies that fly into this territory because they essentially might be uh, risking his ability to uh, get females. And so actually you can even see here's a female that just sort of joined him here. And it's kind of ironic because in our butterfly exhibit, our guests will often see butterflies flitting around one another and they think that they're playing. But in fact, it's actually a complex um, competitive battle between um, uh, different, different butterflies just in order to compete for mates. And so you can see his wings are kind of tattered, probably from flying into other butterflies and things. So his, his uh, wings will, their butterflies' wings will gradually um, break as they get older. Now, swallowtail butterflies uh, practice a behavior much like the egg fly. And uh, what they'll do is they'll sit in one of the highest locations in a particular habitat, and they'll look for uh, females that fly through and claim them for their own. Now, in swallowtails, this type of behavior is called hilltopping. And so a lot of the swallowtails that we have around here in the uh, northeastern United States will demonstrate this. So if you're a butterfly or moth, you might think it would be easy to find a mate just because butterflies and moths tend to have bright colors and patterns all over their wings and whatever. But, you know, like a butterfly, butterflies are mostly active during the day. So uh, they're diurnal. So basically the, they can use the bright color patterns on the surface of one another to locate and recognize each other. But what about a moth? Moths tend to be active at night, meaning that they're nocturnal, right? So how is a moth going to find a mate in pure darkness? Well, turns out I have one of my favorite moths here. This is called the giant atlas moth from Southeast Asia. So she is one of the biggest moths in the world. And as it turns out, she's got uh, little spots here, little sort of see-through patches in her wings. She's got a little dot at the edge of her wing that sort of comes down like this and like this. Um, in fact, in the Philippines, they call her the snakehead moth just because it looks like she's got little snakes on the edges of her wings. Um, those are probably meant to scare off predators or something uh, just to make her look bigger and scarier than she actually is. But so you might think like, wow, this is a big moth. How could a boy moth possibly miss her? She's so obvious and noticeable. But remember, in the darkness of the rainforest, how is uh, he going to be able to find her? And it turns out that uh, the atlas moth female, like all other giant silkworm moths, use pheromones to locate their mates. And pheromones are specific chemical signals uh, from between one, within one species to within one individual from a species to another individual of the same species, and uh, at night she will release this a little tiny yellow gland from her abdomen down here, and that gland will release a blend of chemicals, um, which contain a very specific scent that boy atlas moths can recognize. And boy atlas moths have big bushy antenna, almost like radar antenna, uh, that have specific proteins in them that will bind to the chemical blend from a female atlas moth. And so he can use those antenna to essentially locate a female in darkness. So that chemical, that pheromone that's released from the female, winds up getting carried by the wind. And the male, all he's got to do is locate, um, or basically fly up the concentration gradient of that chemical. So basically following his nose, so to speak. Um, and the more intense that smell gets, the closer he becomes, or he, the closer he comes to the female. Um, and so when he eventually finds her, he'll basically fly around at random until he bangs into her, and he will essentially attach his abdomen to her abdomen, and they'll stay attached for about 24 hours, actually, before they will eventually separate, and she'll go off and begin laying fertilized eggs. Now, you may notice that she's got a gigantic fat abdomen here, and one of the ways to tell the difference between boy and girl um, giant silkworm moths is to look at the size of the abdomen. So the fatter the abdomen, the more likely that it's a girl, and that's just because she's stuffed with eggs. She has a well over 250 developing eggs in there, as well as some fat to sort of keep her nourished while she's an adult. Um, like other giant silkworm moths, these guys don't eat at all as adult moths. They simply come out of their cocoon, uh, and they basically wait for a mate, and they will basically focus their entire life, which is only about maybe 7 to 14 days or so, um, on finding a mate and laying eggs. So kind of sad when you think about it that she's only going to last for maybe like a week and a half or so, but... You know, that's their strategy. That's what they do. So it's interesting that they're able to locate uh, their, their uh, locate a mate in the darkness using, using their sense of smell. And as it turns out, um, the, the, uh, the, the pheromones that are released from the female can actually be carried for upwards of like a mile or so, or maybe even more. That's pretty crazy when you think about it.
here we have our uh, moon moth again from Southeast Asia. This is Actius Ningpoana. And uh, again, a relative of our Luna moth. We actually have moths that look just like this in the Northeast, um, but they're not the same thing. And uh, so what she has been doing for the last several nights is exactly the same thing as our atlas moth that we saw a moment ago was doing. And so she's basically sitting and calling every single night for a male. And she's doing so by releasing a little gland from her abdomen here. So you can see right on the underside of her right here, uh, this little sort of pore, which, yeah, that's her butt. <laughs> it's our excretory pore. But inside of that uh, is actually a gland, and that gland will basically come out of this little pore here, drop down, and will release pheromones. Again, those chemical signals that will signal to males of her species that she's there and ready to mate. And just like the atlas moth, they'll get carried up the, the wind, and, uh, and uh, any male um, moon moths in the area will know that she's there, fly up the concentration gradient, and mate with her. And there you have it. Moths might use chemicals to locate one another in the darkness of uh, their habitat. Other insects have developed different strategies. And so these guys are known as katydids. And katydids are essentially grasshoppers. And they're actually in the same group of insects as the traditional grasshopper that you would see jumping around in a hot summer day. And like grasshoppers, a lot of their communication uh, is dependent upon sound. And so I've got a, a male right up here and a female of what are known as Malaysian, the common Malaysian katydid, Mecapoda elongata. And so I can tell that this is a male because he doesn't have that thing. So right under here, you'll see a little sword coming out of this one's abdomen. That little sword is an ovipositor, and that's for laying eggs. So I know that this is a female and this is a male. And so at night, these guys would be located up in the canopy of the rainforests, and they wouldn't be able to see one another really right away. And they might be distantly located. So uh, rather than using chemicals to find one another, however, they'll use sound. And so if you've ever been outside in the summer on a, uh, a warm summer night in uh, the Northeast, for instance, you'll hear these noises um, that kind of sound like kitty did, kitty didn't, kitty did, kitty didn't, or realistically, over and over and over again. And those represent different species of katydids. So they're kind of like birds calling to one another uh, in the darkness. And uh, if you're really good, you can actually identify one species of katydid from another based on the call alone. Um, just like people can identify bird calls just on the, on the call alone. Now, these calls are species specific and they're indicative of a male's fitness to a female. So the more and it depends on the species, the, the depth and complexity of the call, but basically they'll, they'll signal, they'll do a number of things. They'll say, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a Mecapoda elongata. I'm the species that you want to mate with. I'm right over here. And they'll also say, hey, I'm a really good mate. I, have a, I produce a really, really good sound. Um, and so very often the distance that the sound can carry, the longer that he can carry out a, a signal, um, the louder it is, like a lot of those factors will tell a female just how good of a male she's getting if she decides to go and, and find him and mate with him. And so darkness presents a, a, a lot of issues, but at the same time, insects have been able to figure out ways around the darkness. You may be wondering what that ear-shattering noise is. This is the giant Katie did. So he's using his powerful wings to make that call. I hope you guys can hear it. It is like insanely loud right now. Like unbelievably loud. It's filling the entire butterfly exhibit. Fireflies, of course, have a unique way of locating one another in the dark. So male fireflies in the uh, northern United States tend to come out and hang out in the middle of fields on uh, summer nights, and they will flash their abdomen, creating bioluminescent uh, signals in the night sky, which are species-specific. Female fireflies will tend to hang out in the grass and periphery of the field, uh, checking out the males calling in the middle of the field, and uh, they will signal back to those males when they find a suitable one to come and mate with them. Believe it or not, some predators have taken to uh, 
uh, taking advantage of this particular type of communication. Um, so the photinus fireflies are so-called so femme fatale fireflies because females will tend to sit in the edges of fields and they will mimic the calls of other species of fireflies to attract unsuspecting males to their death or they will then eat them. Um, which is kind of <laughs> kind of mean, but <laughs> that's what they do. Now, scorpions have some interesting reproductive behavior. Like spiders, they are constantly at risk of uh, being ingested by a female if they were to approach her to try to mate with her. Now, this species is known as Titius stigmaratus. It's actually a uh, relatively dangerous scorpion from Costa Rica in Central America. And uh, these guys are a little bit more accepting and tolerant of one another's presence. These guys are relatively communal. Um, but when scorpions mate, what they'll do is they'll engage in these ritualistic dances, just like a butterfly uh, would, in a way. And so he'll use his palps, and right here, those are his palps. He'll use these palps to essentially lock with a female, and he'll dance, and he'll try to woo her. Uh, a little bit and calm her down. He might, for example, bring up his tail here and he might inject her with venom to kind of calm her down. So sometimes she'll get a little bit rowdy and he'll just be, <laughs> he'll essentially just sting her just to chill her out a little bit. And what he'll do is he'll deposit a spermatophore on a little stalk and almost looks like a little white lollipop. So it basically sticks it somewhere like over here and then he would lock claws with that female, dance her around and then essentially maneuver her up on top of that spermatophore uh, so that it goes up inside of her body and um, he will, she will have essentially taken in his sperm. Uh, pretty nifty little trick. Um, so whip scorpions, uh, tailless whip scorpions as well. So some of the critters that we saw in previous episodes will all essentially carry out the same type of uh, uh, strategy. So we saw how a male butterfly might use a flight dance or aggressive behavior fighting off other males in order to communicate his fitness uh, to a female. And uh, we also saw how scorpions might use a ritualistic dance to woo his uh, potential mate into agreeing to mate with him. And we saw how katydids and grasshoppers, as well as fireflies, use both sound and light in order to communicate fitness. But there are other ways of indicating your fitness. And I think one of the uh, more common ways that insects do this is through brute strength. And uh, so here I have a male Hercules beetle. This is a gigantic insect, a gigantic and beautiful animal. And so this is a, um, a pretty, an, I guess I would say an average sized male. They do get a little bit larger than this. These guys come from the rainforests of South America and Costa Rica, from Central America as well. Uh, Hercules beetles are a type of rhinoceros beetle. And the rhino beetles are all very similar in that the males of the species have these gigantic horns and armature that are projecting out of both their back right here, like this big horn is here, or even out of their head like this horn is here. And so he creates this little sort of grabbing, grabby section here in the middle. And the reason that he has this gigantic armature, as well as his gigantic size, is because he fights over uh, females with other, with other males, with other competitors. And so this is a little bit more aggressive than that of a butterfly. So fighting amongst rhino beetles can lead to death among some of the individuals. Butterflies are probably not going to kill each other. They're just going to fight each other off until one of them gives up, essentially. But yeah, this guy can actually fight with, his, with uh, other males. And they've even evolved these little brushes, which I'm not sure if you can tell from the video here, but they have these little brushes of hairs on the undersides of their horns. You can kind of get a better image there. And those hairs are meant to give him uh, strength to grab onto another beetle and hold fast. And he will either try to crush him or he will toss him to the side um, in the hopes of mating with a female. Now, I don't have a female of these guys at the moment, but um, they are quite small. They look like a gigantic June bug that you might fish out of your pool. They really look nothing like um, uh, this guy here. And a lot of different beetles especially these rhino beetles, have these, these differences in their morphology. Now, he looks intimidating, but he's actually quite harmless to humans. I mean, he has a pretty, pretty strong grip, so you can't feel that. If I, if I try to rip him off me, he's just simply digging in with his claws. Um, but 
they're pretty harmless. They don't really do any damage to humans. If you put your finger in here and he clamps down, yeah, it could hurt, but it's not going to rip your finger off or anything. Um, they're actually pretty gentle. They, they feed on fruit, so you can actually see that this is his mouth right here. So even though those big horns look like they would hurt you, they're really, again, there for basically just fighting over females. Now, the longer that a grub, a larval beetle, takes to develop, the bigger and healthier these beetles uh, can become. And so this concept reflects the idea of what's known as fecundity. And so um, this is a male, but fecundity is typically a measure of the amount of eggs that a female is capable or offspring that an, uh, an individual is capable of producing. And so um, with rhino beetles, there's this sort of trade-off because not all beetles will grow to be this big. There's sort of like a cut-off that... Um, where, where a larva is able to pupate and become a beetle, an adult beetle, but if there's plenty of food available, they can keep growing and growing and growing. And that's when you see these gigantic maxima beetles that form. But it takes a lot longer. So if you're a, a larva and you really are running out of food or you, need, or you feel like you want to uh, go to adulthood and, and try to mate as soon as possible, you might not be as strong and you might not be, the, you know, so to speak, the biggest beetle on the block, but you will still be able to reproduce and you'll be able to do so much more quickly and rapidly than someone like this who might take a little bit longer to develop um, as a larva. And so let's take a look at some other rhino beetles. Here we have another type of rhinoceros beetle. This one comes from Southeast Asia, um, unlike the Hercules beetle. And uh, this guy is known as an atlas beetle, or more, honestly, more commonly, just as a, a rhino beetle. But their biology is more or less the same as the Hercules beetle. So this is a big, gigantic male with these huge horns um, coming out of his back and his head. I think this one looks almost like a triceratops dinosaur in a way, uh, just because of the, the placement of the horns. Now, just like the Hercules beetle, however, he is harmless. He's not going to hurt you. Uh, he does get pretty aggressive, though. As you can see, if I tap his abdomen here, he does sort of rear up. Um, he's definitely more aggressive than the Hercules beetle, I'd say. But just like him, though, like the Hercules, these guys are uh, going to basically bury their head in a banana or a piece of fruit all day. They're not going to mess with humans. Um, again, if you put your finger right in the middle of his jaws here, yeah, it might hurt, but it's not going to kill you or not rip off your finger. Now, these guys are strong, very strong. In fact, the Hercules beetle uh, gets his name because of his strength. They're referring to Hercules, of course, from um, uh, uh, Greek mythology, uh, they can lift about 80 times their own weight. And so it's essentially the equivalent of us lifting a tractor trailer up over our heads. These guys are very powerful as well. And all of that strength is there to uh, fight off males. They need to be strong. The strongest real, uh, beetles will be the ones that theoretically a female will be most attracted to. Now, rhino beetles uh, sometimes um, or I should say rhino beetles, are a type of scarab beetle. So scarab beetles are, are fairly common. They're one of the largest families of beetles out there. And not all scarab beetles have these gigantic uh, differences in the males and females. So again, this is dimorphism, uh, sexual dimorphism at its finest. So a female atlas beetle looks nothing like this. She's probably going to be about that big and, again, like a gigantic June bug. Flower beetles are another offshoot of uh, the um, scarab beetles, which are also aggressive. Let's take a look at some of those from Africa. And so here we have another type of scarab beetle. Now, just like the rhinoceros beetles, these flower beetles are very aggressive, as you can see. Males will fight over females, but they don't have the, well, they often, I should say, don't have the uh, elaborate armature of uh, the male rhinoceros beetle. You can see that this male right here, he's got a little, got some horns on his head. Here's another one coming over and basically telling him to back off. Um, now, flower beetles are a little bit less aggressive or damaging, I should say. Um, they're a little more relentless, and uh, they'll definitely go after another male or female. Sometimes the females. I think actually that is a female um, telling another one to back off. But unlike the scarab beetles, this is another type of beetle. This is known as a stag beetle, and specifically, this guy is Dorcas titanus from Southeast Asia. So check out, check out those mandibles. So those two things coming off of his head are not horns. Those are actually his jaws. Now, they're not for eating, however. They are for battle. And so uh, they will essentially fight just like the rhino beetles and the flower beetles. They'll fight uh, other males over the attention of females. Now, right here, I have a female who is uh, playing dead. They actually feign death. <laughs> She's not actually dead. 
But you can see the difference in size. Now that's the same exact species, but they are so dramatically different in the way that they look and their body structure. You'd think they might be two different things. But stag beetles have a habit of being a little bit more aggressive and fatalistic in the way that they duel. So basically this guy will use his jaws to literally cut in half another uh, potential male. They're a little bit more aggressive, I think, than the uh, scarabs are. And um, so they're not terribly, they're powerful enough to draw blood on a human. So if he were to bite down on my hand, he would definitely hurt me. This is a relatively small titan stag beetle. They do get quite a bit larger than this. Um, this is a, the biology is very similar to the rhino beetles in the sense that their larva can essentially mature a little bit before, uh, you know, right after they're, they're able to, as opposed to growing for a little bit longer and getting bigger and, and um, sort of stronger. Um, but uh, the idea is still the same. So the stronger and healthier the male, uh, the more likely he will be able to um, take out competitors and vie for the com competition of mates. Now this is one of my favorite all-time beetles. This is known as a rainbow stag beetle. So uh, very much like this titan stag beetle that we saw a moment ago, this is a leucanid. So not a scarab like the uh, Hercules and the Atlas beetle or the flower beetles, but uh, these guys are stag beetles. And stag, of course, is referring to those big jaws coming off of the front of his head here. But unlike the titan stag beetle, um, these jaws are really not very good at clamping down. Like he'll pinch you for sure, but uh, he's not going to um, really, really get your finger caught there. Um, what those jaws are for, he actually is almost like a forkless. So he'll stick his jaws underneath a competing beetle and flip him over and, and basically remove him from the area so that he can mate with a female. Here I have another two rainbow stag beetles. This time I have a male and a female. So now he's not quite as shiny as the other one. And the shininess that you're seeing actually comes uh, about as a result of the structure of his wings. So uh, this hard shell that you see on the back of beetles, those are actually their wings. And they're called elytra. It's actually one of the features that make beetles beetles. And like butterflies that have iridescent shiny wings, these guys have little like ridges and folds on the surface of their wings, which will cause light to um, scatter and uh, diffract around these little microscopic ridges. And then they'll re be reflected back towards our eyes and give us this sort of crazy kaleidoscope of colors that we see on some of these iridescent uh, insects. This guy just doesn't have quite as much coloration going on. He's a little bit more dark. He's actually got a sort of a purplish blue tint to him. But this girl still is pretty shiny green. And so just I wanted to point out the difference in structures here. So you have the male with the giant jaws and the female lacking those that sort of same armature. And again, just like the rhino beetles, Stag beetles are essentially harmless to humans. They can definitely bite down and hurt you if you were to mess with them, uh, not that you should, but uh, they are food feeders as well. They're not predators. They're not going to bite you and kill you or anything like that. So if you ever see a stag beetle, especially in the United States, you should leave it alone. They're actually relatively uh, not that many of them around due to human activities. So um, we have one in the United States known as an elephant stag beetle. That is a beautiful, massive beetle, but uh, pretty hard to find nowadays due to um, habitat destruction. So never mess with these stag beetles. Much like the beetles that we saw a moment ago, lobsters and many other crustaceans engage in competition uh, over mates as well. So this American lobster here, geez, this is one of our older residents here. Um, covered in algae and whatnot growing all over his back there. So female American lobsters, when they are ready to reproduce, they actually will molt to adulthood and they'll begin releasing pheromones into the water, which will be perceived by the male's antenna, actually receptors in the male's antenna. Uh, males in the area will know that she's ready to mate. They'll come by looking to mate with her and they'll fight one another uh, outside of the little burrow that she will find herself molting in and the winner will basically go inside and keep her safe until uh, her new exoskeleton has fully hardened and she's protected. And so uh, these guys, it's said that they'll mate for life, um, although there are some exceptions to that rule. There's a lot of cheating and interesting behaviors that go on, but I don't want to get into that now. But the point is, um, these guys do, com uh, lobsters and other crustaceans will compete over ma mates in much the same way that those beetles would as well. Now, in terms of competition, one of the most interesting marine organisms is that of the octopus and cephalopods. Now, octopuses are 
uh, able to change their color. And so basically this giant Pacific octopus up here at the aquarium, uh, even though he's kind of <laughs> sitting in an awkward spot right now, he's not really being very active and cooperative in terms of filming here, but you can see his gigantic head right up there. That's his head. And his tentacles are all clustered and grouped right over here. So he's a pretty large octopus. But what these guys do is they will change color uh, in order to woo a female. And octopuses don't necessarily compete with one another directly. But what he has is a specialized tentacle. Now, you can always tell a male octopus. I can't really see it here. But he's got a specialized tentacle up in here. Uh, it's usually the third one on the right. And it has a spoon-like structure at the end of it. This tentacle is called a heterocotylus. And the heterocotylus is used for reaching up inside of a female's uh, genital pore and pulling out the spermatophore or the sperm of another male. So this type of competition happens without the males really ever fighting or interacting. Um, but what they're able to do is essentially get rid of that other guy's sperm and deposit their own spermatophore, which can be up to a meter long, believe it or not. And uh, in so doing, ensure that his sperm will be fertilizing her egg, her eggs. But amazing, an amazing cephalopod, cephalopod uh, for sure. Cuttlefish uh, are, and squid are capable of, of producing these, these majestic uh, courtship displays using color on a reef. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any of them to show you right now, but they, um, they, they almost have a language, essentially, uh, that will communicate their intentions to a potential female or actually between one another. They do this with the, with the use of specialized uh, epidermal cells known as chromatophores uh, that can essentially enlarge and contract in various different controllable ways uh, revealing these different sort of color patterns on the surface of the skin. Now we've seen how these different invertebrates engage in courtship rituals and uh, competitive behaviors and have even adapted this specialized morphology in order to uh, increase their ability to uh, find mates and um, win over the affections of potential mates. And you have to ask yourself, why is this the predominant type of uh, reproductive strategy among animals? So why exactly are we dealing with sexual reproduction in most of these uh, different invertebrate groups? And uh, what it comes down to really is variation. And so I chose this picture here of a bunch of different sun beetles. And this is, these guys are from a previous episode. These are flower beetles, just like the beetles that we saw a little bit earlier. And so um, if you notice in this image here, we have all the same species, but you'll notice there are different color patterns scattered amongst the beetles. If you were to take ones that even have similar color patterns and put them side by side, you'd notice there are different even within those. And so this highlights this concept of variation. And uh, when we talk about variation, we're talking about, of course, genetic variation. And this will then give rise to phenotypic variation, which can help to increase the chances of a uh, specific individual survival in an environment. So for instance, if some of these beetles, um, a cold spell were to come through and in, in, in whatever environment that they're living in, um, if one of these different, you know, for a small subset of these beetles was able to deal with the cold, maybe it had the ability to produce a thermosensitive, um, or rather a thermoresilient protein, they might be able to survive, whereas the rest of them might not be able to, might not be able to, uh, meaning they would not be able to pass on their genetic information, whereas these thermoresilient beetle populations would. And so this is this concept of genetic variation, how it can help to increase the chances of offspring survival uh, under various different environmental stressors. And so um, sexual reproduction at the very basic level involves the combination of two different uh, parental genomes, two different parental haploid genomes, I should say, into uh, a diploid individual. And so all of these uh, beetles are diploid, but each one of them will contribute a half of their chromosomal uh, um, uh, allotment to a uh, future offspring. And so variation is further 
increased in a sexually reprodu reproducing life cycle due to this concept of crossing over as well. So uh, just as a reminder, meiosis is the division of a diploid cell into four haploid uh, uh, daughter cells. And so this is characteristic of uh, the, re the uh, division of cells in the germ line, so the pr for the production of either sperm or egg. And so we can imagine, for instance, that um, if we start with a diploid cell from one of those beetles that we just saw in the, in the previous picture, that beetle has half of its chromosome, or half of its, its genome, rather, that originally came from its father, the male beetle that gave rise to it, and the other half coming from its mother, the female beater, beetle, or its mom, uh, that uh, contributed to her half of the genome uh, to this diploid uh, um, offspring. And so uh, we have both of these different uh, lineages essentially present in this beetle. And during meiosis, what winds up happening, this diploid genome is duplicated to form what's essentially a, four, a 4N or a tetraploid uh, cell. And that tetraploid cell can then either just go ahead and divide uh, through two rounds of division, um, through meiosis one and then meiosis two, giving rise to four haploid uh, daughter cells, or it might also undergo what's known as crossing over during prophase one of meiosis one. And during this time, the uh, non-sister chromatid, or essentially these two, the, uh, the chromosomes, the chromatids from the maternal and paternal lines can uh, meet up and cross over, forming a molecular junction here, and they will share or intermix their genetic information. And what that will essentially do is increase the combinations of uh, different genetic information in future divisions of this, meios this meiosis, of this particular meiosis. And so here we can see uh, meiosis, after meiosis one, it, the, uh, we now have these intermixed um, uh, chromatids here, chromosomes here, and they'll eventually um, uh, assort themselves out into these four haploid um, daughter cells. Uh, now, essentially this, what this is effectively doing is it's increasing the, uh, the combination, the, the level of variation within the daughter cells of this particular meiosis. Now, we can imagine that this can be taken a step further with the concept of independent assortment. So this is the third major contributor to variation during a sexually reproducing life cycle. And uh, independent assortment comes down to the orientation that chromosomes uh, take when they line up in uh, during metaphase one of meiosis one. And so uh, here we have red and blue chromosomes representing, let's say, the maternal and the paternal lines, uh, just like in the last image, kind of. And um, but just remember, there, there are two different lines here, so red and blue. And in one possibility, we have the red chromosomes lining up on one side of the cell, on one side of the metaphase plate, so you can imagine the metaphase plate being here, and then the blue lining up on the other side. And then after, um, after they divide, we have them producing this combination of daughter, daughter cells. But the other option is that the red might, uh, one of the red chromosomes might join up with the blue on this side here of the metaphase plate. And that will give rise to a different combination of um, of genetic daughter cells here. And so even though all of these haploid cells will essentially contain the uh, same type of genetic information, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the genetic level, at the, the level of the base pairs, that those sequences may be different, giving rise to different types of possibilities in terms of the genes that would be expressed on the proteins that can be built. Uh, from that information. And so all three of these, so we have the combination of two parent genomes, we have crossing over, and we have independent assortment, will, which will give rise to variation within offspring to help them deal with particular environmental stressors. And so this is apparently adaptive enough that it's driven the evolution of the uh, male and female characteristics in uh, many different animal groups. And so you see these these intense behaviors, courtship rituals, 
repetitive behaviors. Uh, and then you even see these extreme examples of what is what's known as sexual dimorphism, or basically uh, major differences in male and female uh, individuals in a population for a particular species. So let's take a look. Sexual dimorphism is pretty common in the insect world. So I wanted to show you one of my favorite examples of just how different boys and girls can look of the same species. So right here, I have an adult orchid mantis. Now, she is a very pretty girl. Uh, you may have seen her in one of our previous episodes. I think I showed you one of her babies, the nymphal stages, but she's clearly an adult. And you can see that she's got her wings there. Um, she's actually recently molted to adulthood and she's ready to uh, find a mate. Now, mantis reproduction and courtship can be a little tricky. So chances are, if there's a boy around, even if he does get a chance to mate with her, uh, he may not last too long after that. She might decide to just simply take him out. But I do just so happen to have a boy here. So let me show you the difference in size. You can see the size differential right here. He's a little active, so I'm gonna quickly focus in on him. And there you go. So notice, he is almost a third the size of the female. Interestingly enough, there. so they are literally side by side here. Whoop, he just took off again. He's a little bit active. So I'm gonna put him back in his habitat. But the reason that that size differential exists is simply because uh, he matures a little bit more quickly than the female would. And that will ensure that he will mature to adulthood, go and mate with another mantis, another female mantis, and expire before he has a chance to mate with a mantis, one of his one of his sisters, essentially. So something that's someone that's a little bit more closely related to himself, and that's the idea. And it's thought that that's an adaptation to avoid this sort of uh, inbreeding. Let's take a look at another example. After just a night or two of living together in the same habitat. Our orchid mantises have met up. They went through their little process of courtship. And the female, who I stuffed with flies, accepted the male's company. And now here he is riding around on her back. So these two have essentially formed a pair. So he's going to deposit a spermatophore inside of her. Now, these guys have actually been together for about three or four days now, believe it or not. And uh, just so you can tell, you can clearly see the dimorphism in their sizes, um, which is kind of cool. But anyway, so he has deposited a spermatophore inside of her. She's going to go off and start uh, depositing her eggs inside an otheca, othecum rather, um, within the next few weeks. She's probably going to eat a little bit more before she does that, so she might even kill him and eat him. But again, he's sort of fulfilled his purpose as a mantis now. Pretty neat. This is something you don't usually get to see, but you guys are lucky enough to catch this. So I'm going to put them back in their habitat and let them finish their business and go on about their business. And uh, hopefully, in just a couple of weeks, we'll have some eggs. And then a couple of weeks after that, we will have some baby little orchid mantises. Very exciting. Sexual dimorphism can be pretty extreme in the phasmids, just like the praying mantises. And so here we have Urinema versa rubra, so-called uh, Goliath stick insect from Southeast Asia and Australia. And this big green one up in the forefront here is a, a female, a gigantic female. And she's pretty huge. She's almost about the size of my forearm. But if we scroll down, we can take a look at a male. Now, the male is actually clinging to her abdomen, and he's actually attached right now. There is a uh, another stick insect in the in the front here, the little brown one. That's actually a baby, a juvenile male. So he's not quite fully grown yet. But you can see the adult male there, uh, literally with his abdomen uh, nearly attached to the female. So he is. Uh, in the process of, well, he's, he's basically claimed her and riding around on her back, and uh, he's essentially deposited a spermatophore inside of her so that she can go ahead and uh, lay eggs, and as they pass from her body, she'll catapult them away and they will be fertilized. Now, as far as stick insects go, there are thousands of different species out there. Uh, these guys are one of the more common ones that you, you will see in the pet trade 
fine. Not that you should. They are technically illegal to own. But even though they don't look like sticks, these guys are, in fact, stick insects. They're phasmids. And they are known as black beauty stick insects or uh, Peruvian walking sticks. So they were recently discovered, relatively speaking, uh, in the mountainous rainforests of Peru, where they occur, it's thought at least, in a very small area, just a few square miles of rainforest. They are black in color and they actually have red wings because they are relatively toxic. They emit a nasty uh, plume of chemicals which kind of smells bad and it can get up into your face and irritate you. But uh, in any case, these guys are demonstrating the capability of stick insects to undergo sexual reproduction. So here we have a male mounted up on top of the back of a female, just like the urinema that we saw a little while ago. And so he's claimed her for his own. And very often you'll actually see multiple different males riding on the back of one female, essentially all vying for the chance to uh, hook up with her abdomen and deposit their own spermatophore. Well, with stick insects, you know, sometimes you might, you might think like, well, how easy is it to actually find another male or another female in a rainforest. And you know, honestly, sometimes it may not be very easy. And so some stick insects have developed a, an alternative reproductive strategy uh, that is indicative of many other types of animals, more ancient groups of animals. Let's take a look. So this guy is known as Acrophila wolfingi, or wolfinges stick insect from Southeast Asia uh, into Australia. And uh, these stick insects don't need a male. So this is actually a female right up here. You can tell by her gigantic abdomen here. She's loaded up with eggs uh, that she is, well, she's preparing to load up with eggs, I should say, that she's about to deposit. And uh, wolfinges stick insects at least the ones that I have, do not even have a male. So I've actually had this population of them for the last three or four years now. And they produce eggs that are fertilized and they will uh, produce, they'll grow into diploid organisms, just like a sexually reprodu reproducing organism would. However, they don't have any males, so how is that possible? So it turns out that among insects, there's a very common type of alternate reproductive strategy. I guess it's a form of uh, asexual reproduction in a way. It's known as parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis. Now, parthenogenesis is essentially where a female like this, instead of relying on the union of two haploid genomes, and who and normally during sexual reproduction, they will uh, rely, female will rely on the input of a male haploid component from a sperm cell. Uh, Insects that undergo parthenogenesis, or any animal that undergoes parthenogenesis, will instead rely on two, um, will rely on, on her own haploid genome fertilizing itself. So basically, uh, two of these egg cells will combine in order to form a diploid organism. Now, the only problem with this, if you could call it a problem, or the only limitation of this, is that when an insect undergoes parthenogenesis, they're always going to produce uh, females. So every single one of her offspring will be a female. There will not be any males. And believe it or not, it's been speculated that there are stick insects out there that do not have any males left in their population. They simply exist as a female population. Because when you think about it, if there's really no consequence to cloning yourself over and over and over again, which is essentially is kind of like what this is, uh, why not go ahead and do it? And so there are stick insects that basically we have not been able to locate the males ever or uh, definitely in, in many, many years. And so this is common for leaf insects as well um, and uh, a lot of other different stick insects. And so that leads to this concept of asexual reproduction, which is a perfectly reasonable alternate strategy for reproduction. Uh, so let's take a look at some other animals that undergo asexual reproduction. And so as we saw in a previous episode, uh, corals exist as colonial polyps. So they're animals related to uh, sea jellies in the phylum Cnidaria. And uh, these guys exist as these gigantic colonies of, of individual genetically identical, for the most part, polyps. And so uh, for reproduction, these guys are sedentary. They really don't move around very much. So like other marine invertebrates, what they'll do is they will release sperm and egg into the water column. They'll be carried uh, through the ocean current and they'll uh, intermix with each other, resulting in fertilized zygote formation. And eventually, um, will the, uh, will develop, develop into a planular 
larva, so a little free swimming larva that will uh, look for a location to settle themselves down and begin their life as a polyp. Corals can also undergo asexual reproduction. And so asexual reproduction, just like the stick insects, um, results in formation of two genetically identical individuals. And so if you look at these colonies, uh, you can imagine one of them breaking off or fragmenting off of the entire colony. It might get carried away in an oceanic current. And if it settles in a location that is favorable for the coral's growth, it will begin forming a new coral colony. And so that's a type of asexual reproduction in itself. But uh, during the um, growth of these coral colonies upwards towards the light to capture uh, more, more sunlight for, uh, to satisfy their little zooxanthellae, um, endosymbionts, coral polyps will undergo asexual reproduction by budding. So basically forming genetically identical individuals and they'll essentially direct, cause the direction of the uh, uh, coral colony up towards the ocean surface where they can uh, better maximize their sunlight gathering ability. And so anemones are very similar to corals in their reproductive strategies. And so this mushroom anemone here, which is amazing, very, very pretty animal. This is a singular polyp here. And uh, so mush uh, anemones can undergo the same types of asexual and um, sexual reproduction as true corals can. So both anemones and corals are, are cnidarians, but what about their relatives, the sea jellies? How can they undergo reproduction? What are their strategies? Now, sea jellies are interesting. So they are capable of undergoing asexual reproduction, just like the corals, um, but they also have this medusa stage, which lends very well to sexual reproduction. So during the medusa stage, sea jellies will un undergo, um, and again, the medusa stage being that life stage, the typical jellyfish shape with the bell with little tentacles dangling down. Um, but during the Medusa stage, they can undergo sexual reproduction by releasing sperm and egg into the water column, uh, during which time they will uh, unite and form a zygote and fertilize each other. Now, these Cassiopeia jellies, which may seem like they're dead based, <laughs> based on the way that they're sitting here, um, are actually upside down jellyfish. So their bell is sitting on the bottom here. And so up in their tentacles, they have concentrated zooxanthellae that will allow them to undergo photosynthesis. And uh, so these jellies come from shallower tropic waters where they will uh, almost act kind of like a quasi-coral anemone um, in, their, in terms of their behavior. So they'll, they'll use those zooxanthellae to help them to synthesize food while just giving the zooxanthellae shelter. Now, this is a moon jelly. This is one of the most common sea jellies that uh, can be encountered in the oceans of the world. Now, sea jellies are capable of undergoing both sexual and asexual reproduction. And so if you look at these moon jellies here, you'll notice these four little structures on the inside of the uh, bell here. Yeah, nice clear image of them right now. They almost look like little mushrooms or horseshoes. And those are the reproductive organs. So this is the Medusa stage. So much like the Cassiopeia, this is the, com this is the bell stage, the sort of free floating bell stage um, during which sexual reproduction can take place. So male moon jellies will release sperm into the water column where they'll be taken up by f um, females, or I should say will be taken up by other jellies which will then associate that sperm with the female uh, components of the reproductive system. And that's where fertilization will take place. Now, once the planular larva hatch, now planular larva being the same kinds of things that we talked about when we were talking about coral in the previous episode, these larva will basically uh, uh, be released from the, male, from the uh, mouth of the moon jelly and they'll go off and uh, start their life cycle. Now, during that life cycle, they'll take up a, a sedentary polyp stage, much like a coral would. Now, during that sedentary polyp stage, they're capable of undergoing asexual reproduction as well by budding. And so the medusa stage of these sea jellies is when you'll have sexual reproduction possible, whereas during the polyp stage, you'll have the asexual reproduction possibility. Moon jellies are different uh, from other jellies in many ways because they don't, uh, usually jellies will release their sperm and egg both into the water column where fertilization will take place, uh, initiating the life cycle, but these guys do so a little bit differently. Pretty mesmerizing.
So this variability in um, reproductive strategies can be pretty profound. So let's take a look at a sea star. Now, sea stars have some of the most interesting reproductive strategies in the ocean. So these guys uh, can undergo sexual reproduction by releasing sperm and egg into the water column, just like a um, coral or a sea jelly might. You can see these, all these different common sea star here in our uh, Atlantic Rocky Shores exhibit. And uh, so these sea stars, aside from doing that, can also both release sperm and egg from the same individual, so a type of hermaphrodism. So basically, hermaphrodite being when an organism is capable of reproducing both male and female gametes. So once these sperm and egg are combined and fertilized in the water column, they will form little free-swimming larvae, which will eventually settle out and metamorphose into uh, your typical sea star. These guys can also be produced by asexual reproduction, so basically um, uh, through a process of fragmentation and budding. But perhaps most interestingly, some sea star species can, and I actually don't know if these guys are capable of doing this themselves, but some sea star species will uh, be able to uh, undergo what's known as sequential hermaphrodism. So very much like a clownfish, these guys can um, change their sex over the course of their life in order to best suit the conditions that they find themselves in. So they will essentially shift from a male to female uh, or vice versa. A unique reproductive strategy if ever I saw one. Now based on the way that you're typically learned uh, about reproduction in school, you would think that asexual reproduction is kind of like the ancient, outdated, not really as good, quote unquote, um, life cycle and reproductive strategy, but it's really not true. There's nothing inherently better about sexual reproduction or uh, even asexual reproduction. They're both um, valid strategies depending on their use and when they're used. And so when you think about it, like imagine if you could just simply clone yourself many, many, many times. If you have, you know, if you're well adapted to a particular environment, there's really no problem in that when you think about it. Right, like if you have a lot of mutations and um, you know disease elements that are that are 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 congregating in your genome and your physiology, then yeah, perhaps asexual reproduction might not be be a good strategy for you. But uh, it does definitely have its advantages. And so uh, in the invertebrates, um, I can I can think of I mean we saw a couple of examples already, but but when we, I. I I think of these guys all the time when I think of asexual reproduction. These are aphids. And aphids are a type of true bug, meaning they belong to the order hem uh, Hemiptera. And specifically, they have sucking mouth parts. That's this little beak uh, rostrum right here that she will um, essentially inject into a, a plant and specifically into the phloem, into the sucrose loading um, vasculature of, of plants. And she'll tap right into those sucrose sources. Now, these guys are capable of asexual reproduction, and um, depending on the species of aphid, there are many, many kinds, they can undergo asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction or both, depending on uh, what species you're talking about. And uh, most aphids, however, do undergo some form of asexual reproduction, and specifically, um, the, the, these guys are born pregnant, so female aphids will essentially develop already having an embryo inside of them, which will grow and eventually they'll give birth to it through a uh, live birth, through a process known as vivid, uh, um, they're viviparous, meaning they'll give this live birth uh, of this nymphal stage. And so this nymph will pop out and she will be an exact genetic clone of the mother and she'll already have an embryo inside of her as well. So she's gonna go through the same exact process. And usually aphids, especially in temperate climates, will do this sort of asexual reproduction uh, until eventually they will uh, undergo what's known as, what, they'll, they'll switch over to a sexually reproducing life cycle, usually around the change of the seasons. And so one of the advantages of this is that they will overwhelm potential predators. I mean, when you think about it, if you are going to just produce multiple genetic copies of yourself uh, over and over and over and over again, your, your genetic information is out there, your genome is out there, and there's, uh, it's going to be very hard for uh, predators to take advantage of, of you and essentially eliminate every single one of those genetic copies. So in a way, it's almost like an insurance policy to guarantee that 
some way, shape, or form, your, your genome will be passed down. And asexual reproduction can be used in other ways as well. So uh, for wasps and, and uh, the insect order Hymenoptera, there are some crazy examples as well. And so this is a little wasp known as an inserted, and a, um, they're essentially egg parasites of butterflies and moths. And so this inserted here is, you can see this is a moth egg down here. You can see just how large the, the wasp is compared to the egg. They're, they're very, very small. So they're not like a wasp, like a hornet or a yellow jacket that you're typically used to seeing or thinking about. Um, but these guys will hunt down these eggs. They will lay an, a single egg inside of them. And this egg will develop in tandem to the caterpillar that will hatch from the egg as well, the so-called the, uh, so host. And so one, the egg that the wasp laid, however, will uh, reproduce through... Um, mitosis many, many times, forming what's called a morula. Now, there's two possible outcomes for this morula, but what's going to wind up happening is this morula will divide into polyembryos, so many embryos from a single egg, and that's where we get the name polyembryani from. And so this strategy is asexually, asexual reproduction at this point. So um, the wasp itself may have mated with a, a male, but through sexual reproduction. But the this and this particular location in the life cycle, we're dealing with asexual reproduction here. We're talking about clonal uh, reproduction. And so, um, anyway, polyembryos, uh, basically these little sacs that develop from the morula, can either develop into a soldier larva or a precocious larva, or eventually develop into their reproductive larva. Now, the majority of them, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, will develop into re reproductive larva. And I think it depends really on the type of wasp that you're talking about, the type of insect that you're talking about. But the purpose of these precocious soldier larvae are to go out into the host organism and hunt down other parasites that might present competition to the inserted's offspring. That's insane. So these guys will literally, are, their sole purpose is to go out and kill other parasites in the host. And so that will allow a competition-free environment for these reproductive larvae to develop into pupa and then eventually turn into an adult wasp, which can then go out and carry on their, their uh, uh, their life cycle. And so here's an image of an actual, some of these actual polyembryos or individual embryos and this whole thing being a polyembryo, I should say. Uh, and here's the host caterpillar. So here's the actual caterpillar and here's the host at some point. Um, so this is a mummified corpse essentially. So unfortunately for the caterpillar, uh, it's gone through all the trouble of feeding and, and trying to get ready to become a, a pupa, turn into a moth, and it has gone ahead it's unfortunately not not going to happen. It, it's been destroyed by these by these parasites and all these little dots. I believe are the exit holes of the uh, parasites. And uh, now, one of the most bizarre life cycles of any animal uh, also utilizes asexual reproduction. And uh, this is a very ancient ancient life cycle. And uh, it's a beetle. It's a very unassuming, very like kind of lame. <laughs> looking beetle in many ways, known as a micromalthus, and they pull telephone pole beetles, and they will are typically found in rotting wood. Um, you can find them in the uh, northern northern climates um, in the United States, but uh, they are a very strange beetle. Their life cycle is so weird, and so uh, if we start at the um, oh, and I should should note that because they feed on rotting wood, uh, this is a nutritionally poor environment, and so. You know, it's actually not clear why this life cycle is so complex exactly, but it may have something to do with the nutritional um, composition of their environment. But anyway, so if we start with our, our sexual reproduction here, so if we start with these adult beetles here, we have a female and a male that meet up. They undergo sexual reproduction. That She'll go ahead and lay an egg. That egg will hatch into a triungulin. A triungulin is a type of larva, uh, larva form, I guess you could say, that is characterized by running and sort of very quick and um, they're easy to get around. They're very maneuverable. Um, but this triungulum will eventually hatch, will eventually molt into what's known as a cerambicoid larva or a feeder larva. This guy's the one that would be feeding on rotting wood. These guys are worm-like. They're very grubby looking. Um, so very different than the triungulum. Now, this is where it gets crazy. So the normal well, okay, so this larva can develop into a quote-unquote pupa, which is not quite a pupa, but it is, uh, and then that will turn into an adult beetle, like normal. That's typically the 
you know, the, the complete metamorphosis life cycle that we're so used to with butterflies and beetles and everything. But the most common reproductive strategy of this caterpillar is to, is this uh, grub rather, is to, um, uh, is to turn into a, a uh, reproductive larva. Yes, believe it or not, this is one of the rare exceptions where the immature stage can actually reproduce. And it actually is a form of parthenogenesis that this larva is capable of doing. And uh, this, uh, when you have an immature that's, that, that undergoes parthenogenesis, it's a unique type of parthenogenesis known as pedogenesis. And so the, there are a couple of options here, though. So the, the most common one is a thalidicus um, life cycle or a thicolyticus larva, I should say. And what that means is a, it is a larva that is a female that will give rise to more females with clonal or parthenogenetic um, processes. And so that's what thalidica, uh, thalidica means. And so this female gives rise to these, produces haploid eggs, which will then give rise to these additional triungulants, which are clones of herself, which will then go back into the life cycle. So they'll eventually turn into the cerambicoid larva. And then there are multiple options that they can take once again. Now, clearly this might be, you know, one might say that if, if there's a lot of food available, this might be a good way to go because you can clone yourself many, many times. You can increase the chances of your larval, uh, larva surviving. Um, but the, another art option is to produce a male or I should say a, uh, um, a larva that will give rise to a male. And so uh, this is known as a herinotonchi. And this is essentially where we have a, uh, a pedogenic larva, a pedogenetic larva rather, that will um, give rise to a, another larva. And this larva is a cannibal. So she'll lay an egg, that egg will hatch into this larva. And uh, this is a haploid, haploid larva, by the way. And this larva is a cannibal, and it will always eat the, uh, um, the parent larva here. And so this guy will come back, it'll actually go into the pore from which the egg came and eat this larva from the inside out, grossly enough. Once it does that, it will uh, undergo a pupation and eventually turn into an adult male. This is how adult males in the population are always uh, formed. Interestingly enough, the third and final option is this amphidicus larva, which can uh, go to either one of these strategies as needed in the population. And so these three strategies, or I guess you could say four strategies altogether, um, no one's really quite sure what drives the, the difference in these strategies, but the point is asexual reproduction is used quite liberally here in this uh, life cycle for whatever reason. And uh, it's actually thought that it might have something to do with the bacterial endosymbionts that exist in the females only. Um, so you need to have a, a female that will, with a, with a viable endosymbiont, population of these microorganisms that are capable of digesting rotting wood and the males apparently lack that so uh, it's thought that this might be a strategy to force males out of a, of a particular habitat to a new location um, a new rotting location with rotting wood um, but it again it remains to be seen but anyway this is one of the most bizarre examples of of life cycle i think out there uh, for any animal and yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard to, it really is hard to understand why this happens. This is one of my favorite sounds of spring. Now, even though they're not bugs or invertebrates, I still think it's an amazing chorus. And each one of these little frogs, spring peepers, are calling to locate potential mates. I wanted to thank you, though, for watching our invertebrate biology series. I hope you've learned a lot about these little creatures that have been misunderstood and i hope you've learned to look at them in a different light and next time we're going to be starting off a vertebrate biology series with reptiles and amphibians thanks again for watching be safe out there don't forget to follow the long island aquarium on instagram and the dna learning center on instagram and check us check out on uh, dnalc live some other cool content from the dna learning center have a wonderful week